Welcome everyone. I'm Penny Lewis, the Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Quest for Resilience, Adaptive Strategies for Sustainable Plant Design. This is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series, developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By collaborating on these webinars, we expand the reach of our regional programs across the country. In case you're not familiar with their organizations, they're largely nonprofit and volunteer groups in the United States, the regional groups of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association Sustainability Committee, the Kansas City Native Plant Initiative, and Rescape California. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Laura Hansplant. Laura is a landscape architect and co-owner of Roos Roof Meadow in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, servicing clients on the East Coast and Midwest. Previously with Andrew Pogon Associates, Laura has over 20 years of experience in sustainable landscape design. She has worked on projects in a variety of locations, ranging from Toronto to Virginia. Her current work explores dynamic approaches to planting design for urban landscapes. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Penny, and hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit today about the concept of resilience and what that means for sustainable landscape design. I'm going to touch a little bit on some approaches for adding greater resilience to our designs and managed landscapes. And for me, this is a bit of a journey, so I'm going to pose some questions and some ideas that we're currently exploring. Um, I'm interested to hear about people's experiences on their own with this. Uh, this is an ongoing just dialogue. And I'd like to touch at the end about some of the significance of what this might mean for our designs in uh, more formal landscapes and how cultural expectations play into that. So when I started putting this together, this presentation together, and thinking about uh, what climate change means, I pulled some of my colleagues in the office, and these are some of the words that came up. And Really, you know, for me, when I think about climate change and changing weather patterns and what that means for design, it's rather overwhelming. And sometimes, I know for me, I feel a feeling of helplessness. What can I individually do? And so thinking back on that, I go back to something that happened, an experience I had um, many years ago when I was a student at the, land, at the land, as landscape architecture at the University of Toronto. And I heard Carol Franklin speak. Carol Franklin is um, a landscape architect, and if you don't know her, she's one of the four original founders of Vander Pogon Associates, and she was my mentor for 15 years. And I heard her talk back when I was still in school, and she spoke about their early work with sustainable design, and she was a ball of fire. And I, I said to myself, wow. I got, got up my courage and went up to her after and said, Carol, how do you do that? How do you even start? And she looked at me and she said, you know, look for the small things in each project. It may not be a big thing. Look for the little thing. And that stuck with me. And so what I want to talk about today is about the journey, a journey of looking for the little things and how they have the potential to add up to something big. So the first part of this talk, I'd like to... Um, Think about some of the building blocks we have for resilience. What do we have to work with? And so this is nothing, this is not a new concept, genetic diversity and using cultiv uh, not using cultivars looking for seed grown plants. And we know, we're probably very familiar with why. We talk about conservation for pollinators. We talk about a better fit between species and our local environment. And we talk about preserving regional diversity, regional ecotypes. That's all familiar, but, and that's all very important. Um, but there's another piece to this story that I want everyone to think about. So thinking back to the cheetah, I'm going to do a parallel here. There was an article many years ago in Scientific American presenting some um, research on cheetahs. And what they found is that cheetahs are all genetically twins. Sometime, you know, thousands, 100,000 years ago, maybe again around 10,000 years ago, this species was, it was reduced to just a few individuals in its population and then rebuilt up from there. And so what that means is the cheetahs have very little genetic diversity. They're all twins. And that makes them vulnerable 
to the changes we have now, any kind of change in their environment, any kind of new stress. And when we think about what we do, this gives me pause, because when I think about what we do in our own work, when we're working with plants and managed landscapes, and when we're buying tissue propagated um, plants from a small pool of cultivars, what we're really doing is planting a lot of clones. And in doing so, not only are we not thinking about or maybe um, not engaging with a method for preserving an environmental heritage, we're making our human landscapes vulnerable. So genetic diversity is about resilience in our own landscapes in addition to conservation. So what do we need to do? Uh, we need to seek out seed-grown plants. Now, that sounds easy. Um, it's not. Uh, I wish that more nursery providers more people in the industry would provide information about how plants are propagated. I'm starting to see that. Um, and we also need to have a better understanding of the variations in how seed from different sources perform. You know, we think a lot about sun shade tolerance and height and bloom color and a little bit about bloom period, but we need to think more about how those differences reflect in the way they grow, in the way they play with those plants play with others, and their tolerance for different kinds of environmental stress. Um, and right now, that's something that you have to, one has to really dig for as a professional. It's not easy to find. So the second thing, and again, this is nothing new, is to think about building species diversity into our plant planting designs. And I, I'm sure many of us try to do this in providing more species um, that we work with, not planting monocultures. Uh, but again, I, I, when I start to think about this, it's um, about more than just building up a plant list. Uh, and I go back again to some research I saw some time back that talks about diversity and how it plays out at different scales. And so again, I'm going to step back and talk about um, some uh, research that I read by a gentleman called um, uh, Noss, Reed Noss. And he talked, he was studying bird species. Uh, and he wrote a paper talking about um, the importance of looking at scale when considering diversity. And so in this diagram, you can see that um, edge habitat, habitats that maybe span a couple of different um, plant communities uh, or landscape types, can have higher diversity than species that are elsewhere. You can all, it's called the edge effect, if you're familiar with that term. Um, but when you look across a landscape and step back, you might have several sites that have fairly high diversity. I just made these numbers up, you know, eight, seven, ten. But then they're all the same species. And when you look, the importance of these more unusual habitats is that they add species that you can't find on the edge. In, uh, in, 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 the, um, in our urban habitats. And so how do we, the, the diversity, true diversity comes from preserving habitat at a more regional scale or considering diversity at a regional scale. And of course this speaks to re needs for regional planning imperatives and conservation at a regional scale, but it also gives me to think about how we pick plants for our design. If we are always picking the same plants, uh, the same, we're always going to the same species, the same species. It doesn't really matter whether we have a species list of 10 or 50. If we're all picking the same 50 species, that's not true diversity. We need to be looking for the more unusual species, um, the, the, uh, the maybe lesser known species and looking at how we can fit them into our design. And again, that's not easy. And how do we go about it? I mean, I get nursery catalogs that have plant names, um, and, Carex is a great example that show all these new varieties that are out there, and I don't know from reading it how well they're going to perform. I can call the nursery up, and that's great, and talk to the growers and see what they say. Um, I can look to where that species naturally grows in its habitat and get a sense of what types of um, growing conditions it's well adapted to. Uh, but that's not necessarily the whole story. I mean, if you look at something like mountain laurel, like Kalmia, that might be a species which grows in a lot of very dry, stressful, you know, edge conditions in the wild, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to transplant or easy to put into, say, a post-construction soil or some of our um, urban or near-urban um, landscapes. So one of the things that I play around with is the plant stewardship index and the concept of generalist species versus conservative species. And so if any of you are familiar with the plant stewardship index or the um, floristic quality index is 
a similar tool. It is a tool that um, botanists use to um, consider uh, the, it's used to both rank the a, a given plant species in terms of whether it's a generalist, in which case it gets a low number on a scale of one to 10, one, two, three, or whether it's very conservative, which means that it's very faithful to a very specific habitat and not found outside that habitat, in which case it might get an eight or a 10. Uh, and so, for example, common milkweed or andropogon virginicus broom sedge are generalist species, they would rank low, whereas spirobolus or um, the native sycamore um, or green dragon, which is similar to Jack in the Pulpit, might rank quite high because they're typically found naturally occurring in only a very specific habitat. Does that makes sense? So what I find intriguing is to look at the ranking of those species on a scale of one to 10 and use it as a guide for how adaptable it might be. If it is being ranked as a high number, it means I have to be very careful potentially about how I translate that species uh, into a different setting. And if it's ranked as a generalist, then I might have, it might be an easier thing. So that's, um, that's one thought. But we need more tools like this, more information like this that lets us know how we, what latitude we have to work with different kinds of plant species. One of the things that we do think about here is proportion. And if we're building out a plant list or a plant planting design and we want to um, try some new species, we typically um, introduce them in small numbers and use them um, maybe you know, in 10% or less of the plants that we're, that we're weaving in to our design so that we don't have all our eggs in one basket. And if they don't do well, then you know, it's not a total disaster. Um, ongoing discussion. The next point I wanted to bring up is about letting our plants reproduce. You know, we can go out and look for um, the local ecotypes that are seed propagated and, and do our very best to be responsible in the choices we make about sourcing our plants. And if we, if we install them and don't let them reproduce, then we're only getting about half of it right. They need to be able to reduce and make, reproduce and make uh, future generations to be truly sustainable. And so I walk around, um, often I'm walking my dog or during my day and I take my cell phone and actually I can be kind of an annoying person to walk with because I'm always pausing and taking pictures of little things. And this is one of them. This is a picture of a garden in my neighborhood. And what interested me here was that the um, blue fescue, probably Elijah Blue or something like that, is reproducing into the garden. Um, and this is taken in early spring, and the homeowner hasn't, I sympathize, hasn't gotten around to weeding, cleaning up yet, uh, mulching, and look at all the little babies. And this is good. And this is in a wet corner of my garden. This is gray sedge. I planted um, one plant as a test, and it is reproduced over this corner of my garden. It's actually reproducing into the lawn. Um, and I'm interested in this and following it over the course of three to five years. Um, and I'm interested in that the gray sedge has done well, and the ostrich fern, which I planted near it, has reproduced once or twice and then um, not really survived. And for me, this is resilience. Even though I'm a lazy gardener and I, I, you know, I neglect it, this is part of resilience, is, is plants being able to reproduce and find their best fit in the growing conditions they have. Here's another example. This is from a green roof at Rutgers University. And what's in those little yellow circles, little green circles, are seedling echinacea, called purple cone flower. And they are seeding in from a deeper planter that's on the opposite side of this red wall. Uh, and here, what's interesting to me, and I see this pattern on, we work a lot with green roofs, I see this pattern on multiple um, thin rooftop landscapes, is that the um, plants will grow and survive from seed in places where if we planted them conventionally as live plants, they probably would not have a good survival rate. And so in this example, we've got purple coneflower coming up in four inches with no supplemental water whatsoever. And this population is sustained through reproduction. It has lasting power because enough plants live that they reproduce. An individual plant may not live that long. And so this allows these plants to maintain themselves in this particular setting, even though sometimes harsh conditions come along 
during the course of any given year, which may not let a sing, you know what some of the individual plants uh, they may not tolerate, they may not survive. It's the community. So in order to engage this, this is something powerful, uh, and engaging it means thinking about the seed bank. And you know, I think as designers and gardeners, we often wish that seed banks don't exist, right? Because when we hear seed bank, we think weeds. And so we work really hard in our conventional gardening practices to suppress the seed bank, when in reality what we should be thinking about is managing it. And so in the, the bottom corner, this is um, sourwood oxydendron growing up in a formal mining site, strip mining site in West Virginia. And at the top right of the screen, this is a pin oak in my yard. I wanted a tree and hadn't gotten around to buying one and noticed that if we were a little late mowing the grass in the spring, uh, we got all these free seedlings, so we simply staked them out and uh, so that the, you know, no one would run over them in the lawnmower and let them grow. And now I have a, you know, a 15, 20 foot um, young tree. So, and that in some ways is great because it didn't cost me anything and uh, it's seed grown and it's um, from a local, it's from a local population. So how do we, how do we use that? Can we use that as a tool in the way we design and maintain our landscapes and that brings on a bigger conversation of course about management and timing and opportunity and how we structure that so um, how do we know if we can do this kind of thing well one of the things you know one can look for is whether or not you have native soils and are they good soils because you know the seed bank can hold many species obviously and some of them you really might not want um, and sometimes there is something you do want this is a um, Early spring is actually a great time to look for cues to this because you might see seedling native trees like the oak example I showed you. In this case, this is the Morris Arboretum in, uh, outside of Philadelphia. And here we have um, spring beauty and the white flowers growing up out of a lawn. And most of the year this lawn just looks like a lawn, but there's this remnant um, wildflower population that lives quite happily um, in, in an older lawn. And I do see this in other older properties. That's one cue that there might be other good, you know, if you were looking to change the cover type, that's a cue that there might be other good species there. And actually, this is a powerful enough way of looking at a landscape that um, the New Jersey Audubon has a guide out um, called, they put it out some years ago, um, called Meadows on the Menu. And it's a guide for homeowners on how to create meadow in your backyard by, um, by using the native seed bank that might exist there. Um, so if you're interested, you know, you can look that up. So here's another example from another green roof that we um, manage and follow. And I really like this picture because of what it reminds me about the power of seed bank um, and the seeds that you might either introduce or volunteer on a, on a site. Uh, and so this is, um, in this picture, you can see plants that we planted intentionally. There's um, the um, goldenrod, Salodago sasasalata, that's the... Um, Golden Fleece Goldenrod, there's a Threadleaf Coreopsis here. There are plants that, some of the grasses were planted intentionally. This was meant as a metal roof. Uh, we also have plants that have um, come through intentional overseeding. In this case, the Dotted Horsemint, Monarda punctata, that's a biennial. Um, and uh, the Retibita here. And then we have plants that have been volunteered completely on our own. Like, get this, Great Blue Lobelia on a green roof. Who'd have thought? Uh, and we had wild geranium, we had common milkweed, and those are coming out of the seed bank that came with the potted plants. And so we have seed from all three sources. And so this though tells me a couple of things. If we don't mulch and if we manage, sometimes the surprises are fun and there might be something we want to work with. And it tells me to buy plants from a really good nursery. All the things we, we, we know. Um, but goodness, if this had been from, if these plants had come from a nursery that was less about um, responsible choices and plant propagation, maybe, and less emphasis on native plants, we might have ended up with miscanthus, we might have ended up with crown vetch. But instead we got great blue lobelia. How cool is that? So then the next piece that I wanted to talk about was how we build these, um, how we use these tools intentionally in design and what are some of the possibilities we have for that. All right. I'm trying to advance the slide here. Excuse me. 
There we go. So the first thing I want to think about is about functional relationships and not just the variety of species because we do talk about that. What's, what's our community of plants are putting together? But think about how they knit together. And in this sense, we're used to plant, we're used to thinking about um, plant communities. I'm going to focus here um, on meadows and because uh and on herbaceous plant communities because i think they're less well understood you know there's a fair amount of discussion i think it's already out there about um, canopy trees and understory trees and shrubs and that's more familiar to most of us um, but meadows and stuff are, are perhaps less so and so when we look at this slide this is from um, duke farms in new jersey we see a a meadow which has been let grow up that has um, a matrix of grasses and uh, drifts of white beard tongue. But when we look more closely uh, at native meadows, we see something surprising. So we might think of a meadow similar to this picture, this is the warm season meadow um, in Philadelphia. But underneath, look up close, we've got moss. And I never thought before about meadows having an understory, but they do. These plant communities knit together vertically as well as horizontally. And here's another example um, from Pennypack Restoration Trust in Philadelphia. This is a cool season meadow underneath a, uh, a canopy restoration project as part of their, um, some of their older initiatives to close forest gaps. This was taken, goodness, five, six years ago. But looking up close, again, there's an understory in this meadow. We see cool season grass, but on the ground, we have violets, we have GM, there's some buttercup um, with ranunculus, there's even some poison ivy. It's pretty diverse. Here's an example from West Virginia. This is a, the edge of, of a young woodland, a red maple woodland, and look at on the ground. Look how tightly knit that is together. Here's an example from a green roof in um, Washington State. And I got really excited when I saw this roof because, again, look at how these plants knit together. Look at how the, in this case, the Achillea knits in with the sedum spurium. Here's some dianthus. It's very tightly interwoven. Here is um, a, a native penstemon seedlings coming up out of, again, a moss-like sedum carpet. This is Clarkia. And these were introduced by seed. The gentleman who was managing this roof was, as part of his maintenance program, intentionally introducing seed on top of the live plant. So here it's an example of, of a landscape, in this case a green roof landscape, that's planted conventionally, which is part of the management is overseeding. And then that's being edited and curated to see what that's like, see what comes up, to see if we can make it more diverse and interesting and regionally um, relevant. So then this is, uh, I would like to talk about another case study where we explored this idea. This is uh, at the Krishna Center for Nanotechnology at the University of Pennsylvania. And it um, has a green roof that you can see here, but it has another green roof that you can't see just off the left side of the slide. And this, that green roof was most interesting to me because it was designed as a very thin, extensive green roof planted solely in sedum. And right about the time it was going into construction, the um, design, the architects came to us and said, you know, we really want our lead credit. Can we get a lead credit for that sedum roof? And I said, well, no. Uh, a, a, a sedum roof on its own does not have the structure, the plant structure or the plant diversity to be able to qualify for a habitat restoration credit. And they said, well, could we plant it with you know, native species and I said, instead? And I said, yes, but you'd have to provide more soil depth. You'd have to provide irrigation. And that just wasn't in the cards at that point. So you know, we got the phone. We had a little discussion. We said, well, what if we overseeded it? And I said, well, OK, we could do that. And even just, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like. It could look like a mess. But we could put together a great looking plant list and we can see what comes up. And so this is what happened. So in the first year, you don't see much. This is the seed of mats on the left. You can, these little sprigs you see are actually planted ornamental allium, allium cernum, it's our native allium. Um, but looking, so it doesn't look like much happened. But looking up close, you can see some of the annual wildflowers and you can see the seedling grasses and they're really small. By the third year, now we're starting to have something different. This is little blue stem um, that you can see most predominantly here coming up. And it's coming up patchy. Um, it's not necessarily coming up where I would have predicted it as a designer or in the geometry. I might have 
predicted as a designer, but it's coming up and it's coming up and surviving and in conditions which if we planted it conventionally, it would not do well. We would have had very high mortality if we planted four inches, you know, live plugs into four inches of soil unirrigated and just walked away, which is, this, you know, this was, this was maybe irrigated for the first couple of months and then it stopped. And this is what it looks like in the fifth year. And here you can see it's pretty diverse. We've got little blue stem. We've got side oats gramma. We've got split beard blue stem, Andropogon tenarius. Uh, we have um, some, uh, Sporobolus asper, the tall drop seed. We've got purple love grass. Uh, it's a pretty diverse uh, set, of, set of grasses that are growing up here. Um, some wildflowers, that's another story. Uh, and they're starting to self-sort. And I find it really interesting. And the, the, I find it really interesting to watch this result as it evolve, develops over the years. And what's most interesting for me is not that you're able to overseed a green roof like a meadow. In retrospect, that's not that surprising. What is interesting to me is we're able to do it in conditions where live plants maybe wouldn't do well. And that we're able to introduce species or a range of species that perhaps we couldn't purchase as easily live from, and we could purchase them if, we're thoughtful about it from local ecotypes, which again is easier from seed. And so it has us asking the question, should we be doing more combination plantings where we're using seed in combination with more conventional life planting techniques and what does that yield for us? And so um, looking back at it, you know, we, we, I, I found a paper uh, out of Tufts. I have, I'll give you the reference at the end of the show. We've got this where they did an academic trial of just this relationship. How do native species survive on, in a growing trial where they're not given much water, not given much soil in combination with seed, sedum and without sedum? And I wish I'd known about this before we did the, you know, the previous project, but it was interesting to find out after the fact. They discovered that in combination, the native plants survived better when they were planted in, with sedum as a companion crop. And they found that the, that the um, perennials and grasses were dwarfed. Maybe there's more competition for water. So they didn't grow as tall in the good season, in the good times. But in the lean times, the dry times, they had much better survivability uh, and better, showed better, better drought resilience. And so I think we need to think more, not just about green, this is for greeners, but in our, our ground landscapes, what are those functional relationships? What are the equivalents, the functional equivalents that let us pair plants in ways that give them more tolerance to weather, uh, variable weather that lets them reproduce? And can we use this as a way to knit together a plant community, which then takes less weeding, allows for reproduction, all these things we've been talking about. So the slide at the right, I took at my local library, and this is um, Loriope spicata, and I kind of wince when I say that, because I do not spec and I do not advocate planting in, you know, invasive monocultures like this, but what I found interesting about this, and the reason I took the picture, is that in early spring or late winter, look at the holes, even a, with the little gaps, even a dense planting, like the conventional Loriope, has gaps. I bet this is where the weeds come up later in the season. And could we, you know, can we look to this kind of conventional pattern and introduce plants into it in a way which knits together in a healthy and functional way? So then I'm going to step back to another example. This is uh, from Haverford College, uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And this story is stuck with me. Uh, this happened back around um, 2010. They have a beautiful campus with um, large trees, beautiful sweeping lawns around the historic buildings, uh, sports fields on the edge of campus, and then downslope from the sports fields there's a road. And one of the story, one of the, the um, stories that they related to us, we were working with them at the time, um, was that the pinetum collection, which you see outlined in green, their pine collection, which was pines in lawn. Um, sat between, this is the main campus, or the historic campus, here's the sports fields, here's the pine needham, here's the road. Every time it rained, water ran off these uh, sports fields and the sloping lawn of the pine needham down into the road. Uh, you can see this is what that looks like. Here's that we're standing in the road, here's the strip of woods, and then here's the pine needham that you can see in the background here through the trees. And so this road flooded. And one of the things that they tried on a, uh, 
for different reasons, was to let the lawn in the pinetum grow up into meadow. And um, the grounds uh, manager who was uh, working on this just let the grass grow. I mean, and just stopped mowing. And notice, coincidentally, that the road stopped flooding. Well, then there was some debate in the university community about the meadow and whether or not, you know, it fit the university aesthetic or, you know, a, a neater aesthetic of the expectation for the campus, and they mowed the grass again. And the flooding started again on the road down slope. And so now they've gone back and they've, they've this picture is more recent, allowed the meadow to grow up. And it raises a question, you know, for me, it highlights an issue about um, how we not just design the landscapes, but how they're presented, how they're managed, how they're stewarded so that people understand them so that they're that the benefits, these larger benefits that they're bringing to our landscapes are understood and not just coincidental. And I think that really in terms of long-term success, we can talk about the different tools and the concepts as we have been, but it's also vitally important that we talk about how they're presented um, into our culture and, and knit into our cultural landscape in a way that people understand them. Um, and so the next part of the present was presentations about that. And so I, I come back when thinking about this, how do we design these kinds of plant communities that are diverse and um, interwoven in a way that they don't look like an unholy mess? And in thinking about this, I looked at Turkish carpets. And one of the things I, I do think about is look at the pattern here. We have a very distinct border. We have a... Um, different interior and that there's many different textures and colors here but somehow they are harmonious in the way they go together aesthetically and can we use that as inspiration for planting for pattern clarity and so i went around and started photographing natural landscapes so this one is from bowman's hill wildflower center um, again a short drive from philadelphia and this is their warm season meadow it's got a kind of a natural tapestry quality to it here's one from um the uh the woodland area on the same property again is that a tapestry is this something we can use as inspiration for how we structure design different matrix if you like plants interwoven with supporting players in this case the virginia bluebell that may be more ephemeral here's um, ostrich fern and um, wood poppy yellow wood poppy on the same property so tapestry Here's one from the green roof at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden shortly after it was planted. And I think of this in my head from a design point of view as a uniform tapestry. Has it stayed uniform? No, probably not. You know, plants move and drift over time. But initially, you see the prairie june grass and the, um, the uh, penstem and hirsutus, the hairy blue uh, beard tongue. Uh, and there's uh, probably uh, a dozen species interwoven in this, but the effect is very uniform. Here it is at a later season. You can see the orange butterfly weed and the purple prairie clover in among the warm season grasses, but it still has this really fairly uniform effect. The question for this is, how do we manage for that? If this is what we want, how do we keep that going? Here's another different example. This is from Jackson National Headquarters up in Michigan. This green roof, think about the Turkish carpet, has a very recognizable frame. And so instead of being a uniform pattern, has a very banded pattern, and that's very deliberate. And so in this banded pattern, there may be multiple species in each of the bands, but they were intentionally designed so that any one species would um, be very visible or prominent at a given time, and so the effect would look highly stylized, if you like. And this is so that it would go down better visually with the um, expectations from the executives and the community that uh, work in, in, in the building. Uh, and so here you see um, in the silvery seed heads, that's prairie june grass just going, into, just going into seed or into bloom. Here it is a month later, the prairie june grass has gone to seed. You can see on the left near the person who's doing the weeding, the purple liatris is coming up. But these effects, these could have been random. We could have placed these plants randomly, but instead they're, they're zoned in order to um, create recognizable pattern, which is somewhat artificial, if you like. This is it at, um, in the fall. And again, the, um, the, the grasses are zoned by taller panicum and its friends, shorter grasses, in this case, probably spirobolus and um, Uh and um, 
in, in a shorter zone with a different texture. And then there's a third zone that has a higher proportion of wildflowers, which have a very different texture and color. So painting, if you like, within the principles that we've set down for ourselves about diversity and layered planting. And so then how do we take with this? The examples I've been showing are very, um, are, are very, still fairly wild, still fairly natural looking. So how do we translate this into higher profile settings where we have maybe different expectations and different um, assumptions about what we want from our landscapes? And so um, this is a picture from the Morris Arboretum outside of Philadelphia again. Here I'm looking to research from Joan Nessa, uh, who has published studies regarding people's perception of landscapes. And she talks about uh, in terms of what they find comfortable in a balance between all natural and all groomed. And she's found that there's a uh, middle ground where a landscape has a bit of both. And so here you can see how the lawn is used to frame and provide a very well-maintained skirt for the larger warm season grass meadow. And when we see this, we know that this is a maintained landscape. It doesn't look like it's just let go. And that perception is vital. Um, the other thing that the Morris Arboretum does, I think, which is uh, another reminder for me, is to have these kind of artful focal points, in this case, the sheep sculptures. Again, that let us know that this is an intentional landscape. This is a picture from um, Edinburgh Gardens in Melbourne, Australia. And here what I like is the contrast of the built form, the curbs, with the um, softer uh, rain garden planting. And again, that frames up and that gives the rain garden structure and kind of a designed intent. It clearly communicates a design intent. Can we, use, can we do more of this kind of thing in our naturalized landscapes? And so here's the High Line in New York City. And this picture, I think, captures for me all of these principles. The, the built form and the contrast with the neat edges to the wilder meadow-inspired planting. Um, the way the planting contrasts not only with the sort of artful uh, plant paving pattern, but the historic railing and the frame of the buildings. And that contrast is really powerful. So thinking about how to apply that to work, I, here's another interesting story and case study. This is Sierra Green in Philadelphia. It's an urban park um, on the 12th floor of a parking garage overlooking the center city. And the design intent was meant to have both open lawn spaces that could be used for large events, but also these meadow-inspired um, plantings that would um, contrast the more uh, complement the skyline and contrast the more groomed landscape. And so while the, the space has these big events, um, it's also meant to have moments like this and to foster moments like this. It's an experience that's harder to get in the city. And so the question for designer, as, you know, from the a, a design team became, how do we structure this kind of um, meadow-inspired landscape in a way where it'll be understood and, and uh, recognized as being intentional and not just a, a random mess? And so in thinking about this, I want to, again, step back and talk a little bit about pattern. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the difference between functional pattern, pattern that arises out of out of a functional realities or, or functional relationships in the landscape and cultural pattern. So this example shows from Houston Meadow in Philadelphia again, you can see the very strong response that the native plants, the meadow plants have to the tree. That's based on a functional reality about a difference in growing condition. And we need to recognize those relationships and respect them and work with them obviously, obviously in our planting. But then we also have plant patterns that are cultural. You know, this is from Duke Farms in Hillsborough, New Jersey. You can see the very, you know, formal lining of the um, London plane trees. And this is obviously a cultural um, pattern or, or one that we all recognize. And what's interesting to me, and looking back over, you know, a series of design discussions, you know, through the years, I discovered that we have a tendency to use pattern as a way to communicate design intent, um, even if it's not actually necessarily um, functionally based. So if we're doing a planting, say, I'm going to make it up, say for an environmental center, we may plant all our trees staggered, 
Why? Because it's our way of designers of, of saying, this is, a, this is a sustainable design. Look, my trees are staggered. And in reality, we have the freedom to say, we could, we could put these trees in a row. We could put them in a random group like a grove. And to some extent, those are decisions that are at our, at our discretion as a design as part of the, the flavor and the feeling of the design, and as such, they're malleable. They aren't necessarily, the fact that the trees are in a grove versus a line does not necessarily, is not necessarily intrinsically tied to a reality of the function, uh, of the underlying function of the landscape. I hope that makes, I hope that makes sense. So that understanding the difference between those gives us, is important, and it gives us something to work with when we're trying to blend these kinds of natural landscapes into a more formal setting, say in our cities. So here you can see a meadow inspired planter that has the plant, in this case, prairie drop seed put very deliberately in a row at the front of the planter as a way of saying, hey, here's a formal move so that you understand that this is a well cared for planter even if the plants are more random as they move back in the planting bed. Does that make sense? And you know, here's another example, taking a meadow and can we band it? You know, it's just explorations and seeing what will help the um, the meadow fit neatly into this more corporate setting. And so this one's banded. You know, and and again, we're playing around, if you like, experimenting. You know, in this case, the liatra uh, is is in a row. Originally, actually, it was an even a straighter row. It's moved a little bit, uh, and that's the way we could have put it staggered through here, that would have been fine too. I would argue that at least in this setting, that choice is aesthetic and somewhat discretionary and, and is not tied necessarily to how well this plant community performs. Uh, and interesting story, when we planted it, um, one of these plants rolled downhill and got planted out of line. And I got a text from the owner saying, is this a weed? It wasn't in bloom. So it, it could have passed for a weed. And I texted back, no, no, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And we went and we, you know, dug it up and moved it back in line. It's like, oh, okay, now it looks right. And so there's this interesting tension and dialogue between, you know, creating these functional uh, relationships and layering and getting the patterning so that it looks right to our general, you know, our general eye, our cultural eye. I find that really interesting to explore. So the last point I want to make for this uh, particular slide is that while there are moments in time when a planting design might look like you intended it with kind of the richness and the layering you intended it there are moments inevitably when it doesn't and so here you can see that same bed later in the season when uh, we have a gap in the blooming and it, it's it's looking a little rougher and interestingly what we worked on with this owner was to plant in um in, in the gaps between the, the maturing warm season grasses, uh, an annual flower in a formal way. And it's interesting to me, there's a real imperative need that, or cultural thing we have going with planting seasonal plants. And um, rather than sort of turn up my nose at uh, you know, the cabbages and the violets and whatnot, that pansies that get stuffed around, you know, what we're starting to ask ourselves, is there ways we can use that habit, that, that, that tradition as a way of um, providing, again, a formal edge to a planting that's a little wilder so that the two can coexist uh, comfortably in, in a more formal setting. Uh, and so you know, that year, this year, this was Angelonia. This year, I think we came in and put in Echinacea in October of all times, but as a temporary, you know, dressing up, um, that's, maybe that's okay. Um, maybe if you were, you know, a, a more per if we were all more perfect designers, we wouldn't need to do that, and it would stand the whole year on its own merits. Um, but uh, I find it in this other path an interesting dialogue. So this last case study, this is my last case study. So we're getting close to the end of the presentation part of this session. So if anybody has questions that you haven't submitted, um, this next couple slides would be a good time to do that. Um, this is, again, in Philadelphia. This is an older residential apartment building that had a have a wooded entry that had really aged and what they asked us to do is to come in pull out a lot of the ivy and the and the older shrubs and to refresh it and they wanted it to feel like it fit in the setting for the Wissahick and Valley Woods which is where the, where this is near and so 
the details of this plan aren't important. What's interesting to me as a design process is to think about how we wove these little ribbons through the existing plants. And then each of these represents four different um, mixes. And rather than count it all, plant, draw them all out, we said, we're going to work with your crew when you plant these, and we're going to help you place them. So each mix maybe had four, five, six plants, and we said, okay, let's do a mock-up, and we'll get this particular mix right. It might be the hookah or a tiarella, you know, fern mix, or it might be the all fern mix, or it might be the, you know, the actea and, um, and um, all salmon seal mix, but whatever those mixes were, we said, okay, we're, we're going to work work out how they're laid out in the field with you and then okay you've got that down now you're the guy who's doing group a go for it you know and fill that out and so these mixes are all blends of different plants which are meant to make this tapestry try to translate these ideas of tapestry into the into this setting and then Similarly, in order to have it be readable, we've also been playing with, and I remind myself about this contrast, in this case, the iris with the hookah or tiarella. You know, can that high contrast make it look designed? And then again, because we knew this particular client liked to put out seasonal plantings, we had a skinny ribbon that was meant to be seasonal plantings, whether that was mums in this case, whether that would be something else in a different season, uh, we we built that into the design. Now this was a lesson for me because ironically, we did not um, we did not document that well in terms of a maintenance um, document. So when this project got turned over from the installing contractor to the ground staff, that link got forgotten. So now we have this growing matrix of woodland plants and we have a ribbon shaped hole where the mums died out and they didn't get replanted. But I like the concept that's trying to fit this balance between the, the cultural traditions and the, the, the sustainable design principles. So in summary, you know, what we've been talking about are looking for seed grown plants, looking for a diversity of species, including carefully selected less usual species, conservative species, specialist species were appropriate. I would love to have a forum where we could exchange that kind of inf information about how those do because figuring that out is an ongoing conversation and process, obviously. We talked about allowing plants to reproduce, about having layered plantings, about thinking about plant combinations as tapestry and using a tapestry um, iconography as a way to try to guide the aesthetic decisions of how we put things together. Um, making use, deliberate use of pattern, and thinking about well, clean, well-kept edges. What would I like to do next? I'd love more information from nurseries on plant propagation methods. Um, I would love more information about whether particular plants are pulled from, are being propagated from a given ecotype, or how those different ecotypes perform. I would love to know whether when we see varieties sold or, or, or marketed, whether they're actual ecotypes or whether they're tissue propagated selections. That's not always clear. It could be either. Um, we need to think about different ways of structuring our maintenance, which of course is nothing new to anybody. Um, but that, again, is an ongoing conversation about how we can restructure maintenance in a way where it's effective and timely and helps us um, be better stewards and be better connected to the life cycle of the projects we work on. So um, I'm ready for, I think, questions. Uh, and at the bottom of this is a list of some of the references I've mentioned going through if anybody was looking for those. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. Lots of great information. We have a few questions. What nurseries are you working with uh, on the East Coast that are making progress with increased seed grown native plants? Um, yeah, so we, uh, one, of the, one of the nurseries in our area is um, North Creek Nurseries. I love the fact that their um, website and certainly their catalog has information about how their plants are propagated. Uh, and they do give some performance information um, about things like salt tolerance or um, drought tolerance, which is helpful. Um, I also actually look at Prairie Nursery up in Wisconsin. I look at their catalog because they do sort their plants into groupings by um, habitat type that they're adapted to. So I can look them up by like dry prairie, like dry 
um, versus mesic versus wet, and, and I find that helpful. And they also present information on root systems, if anybody's interested in, um, is thinking about uh, root systems and how root systems knit together. Um, but there are many local, small local independent nurseries who um, are propagating their own plants. I know from my own garden, I go to many of the local wildflower centers who do plant sales on a smaller scale. Um, and, you know, every, every, you know, every year. And I know there I can find in small quantities for my own test garden, um, unusual species that I might otherwise have trouble finding. Thank you. Have you either determined on your own through your planting experience or do you have a resource that you go to to determine the quantity of uh, any given species to have a positive impact? Um, I guess I am not clear for the question whether positive impact means in terms of advocating for a new species that we want to see more in the trade or whether we're talking about the performance of the individual plant community um, I, that we're designing. I believe the this is referring to the impact of the plant community that you're designing? Um, so I guess when we're working on a design, we're always mentally sorting plants into their role. So is the plant that I'm looking at going to be a, a matrix plant that is, for, which are often for what we're designing, usually grasses that are knitting together to form the backbone, the kind of stable cover, or am I looking at a, um, at a wildflower or other perennial that is like a supporting player in this that I want to use as an accent for seasonal color and to kind of knit in the interstitial holes. Um, and I would make different choices about, um, about uh, proportion uh, based on that. Um, if we're, and I also think a little bit about how available it is and, and how it's gonna reseed. So for example, um, Pentamin digitalis, the white beard tongue, I find re where it's happy, it recedes prolifically. So if I want that in our design, I know I don't have to put it in in a large quantity um, in order to have it be potentially very prevalent. In fact, we may have to edit it out as the landscape um, matures. Um, similarly, for some of our really low landscapes, where you, if we're using a plant like Calinum, I, which is an annual, it recedes very well in these um, sort of thin green roofs. I know we can put it in as a live plant rather than seed because it's easier to get that way. And a few of them, if they're planted in the spring, if they're happy, they'll be all over um, because they, they come back every year by reseeding. Um, however, in contrast, something like um, Sparabolus prairie drop seed, it's long lived and I haven't found it to reproduce much. So if we want it, we use more of it and we use it where we want it because uh, provided it's not overwhelmed by taller plants, it will stay put and really persist and make this long-lived clump. Um, so I'm always this is always going back to trying to better understand how the plants perform and then to be able to use that knowledge uh, helpfully in terms of making decisions about the plant community. All right, thank you. Does the stewardship Plant, the plant stewardship index assign a priority for what species should be installed? No, the plant uh, stewardship index is used, it per assigns um, a number from one to 10 based on how conservative the plant is, so how faithful it is to a given habitat. Um, but it doesn't set regional conservation priorities. It is, however, and I didn't explain this, during the presentation. It is, however, meant to be used as a tool to quantitatively evaluate plant communities. So it's meant to be an easy to use tool where as a manager, you can go out on a year, count heads in terms of presence, absence about the species that are you're finding in your, the plant community that you're managing. And then you can run the index number and it will give you a number. And the higher the number, the more, the better value the higher the purport, the, it gives you, run, gives you an average rating based on the plants you have. And if you have more native plants than invasive, and if you have um, more conservative, in other words, fewer species, in other words, fewer generalists, it'll give you a high number. And then you're intended to be able to run it successfully, su sorry, iteratively over time 
and be able to quantitatively get a sense of whether or not your management is pushing the plant community towards higher value. So it's meant to be used as a tool for you to make your own decisions about that. All right, thank you. How do you manage soil compaction when you're maintaining green roofs and how do you tread lightly upon the soil? Oh, that's a great one. That's a great one. So uh, green roofs, it's, so, it's a similar conversation, I guess, to what you might have for your lawn. So if, if you're walking on it once in a while and it's fairly dispersed, you know, the green roof, whether it's sedum or it's meadow, it, um, the compaction isn't a big issue. What is a big issue, um, like it is for your lawn, is when you have a very focused line of travel that's used frequently and then you get those cow paths. And then we do get compaction. Um, and in those cases, we're trying to, we're, like you would be for an on-ground design, predict what those paths of travel are like, likely to be and to put down some stepping stones or something to be able to manage it. Um, the one issue that is a big deal, which it is actually, it's, it's not that different from what you would see on, on an on-ground installation, is when there's a lot of people um, walking over, a lot of foot traffic or other kinds of traffic on the growing media before it's planted. Um, and it does get, if it gets compacted universally through being abused during the construction process, then that is an ongoing impact that's very difficult to recover from. We do see a difference in the weed pressure. We do see a significant difference in weed pressure and plant establishment rate and in plant viability where we have compacted soil. And so addressing compaction before planting is a very real issue and concern, just like it would be on the ground. Okay, thank you. This is another maintenance question. How are these installations maintained in a true sustainable fashion as the years go by with maintenance crews changing uh, frequently as they do and changes in the landscape management structure? Yeah, we have all sorts of discussions about this. So this is definitely not something for which there, as you, I'm sure you already know, there is a magic bullet. Um, one of the, we talk about a handful of, of, of ideas. One of the things we do talk about is making sure that what people have is some sort of guide or handbook to weeds. And so rather than worry about whether or not you recognize all of the, you know, many plant species that might be up there, what you need to be able to recognize are weeds and be on top of the weeds. Um, and so, then you could say, well, maybe what we need to do is recognize half a dozen plants like clover and foxtail and be on top of those. Um, we do find that the best success comes when we have four parties in the discussion mix. You have the owner, um, you have the contractor. Um, it's helpful to have the designer or somebody who is a similar horticulturalist available as a resource. So you can get a text message saying, hey, I don't know what this is. Do I need to worry about it? And you can answer it. Um, so to have a resource, a knowledgeable resource to help guide the contractor is helpful. And then it's very helpful to have a local advocate. So whether that is someone on the contracting team or whether that is something on the owner's side, but someone who is at that site very regularly, who can see when early when something's happened and then um, raise a verbal question. Um, otherwise, you know, like anything else, if you have absentee maintenance where people are only coming every couple of months, um, it is, um, and there's no eyes on the ground in between, um, it's very difficult to stay on top of things. So we're still talking about how to fix, how to, how to adjust that model. Okay. All right. Uh, two questions about overseeding lawn turf. One is, mm -hmm. Have you had any experience uh, with stilt grass and trying to overseed to get a meadow? The other question is, have you had any experience trying to overseed crabgrass without removal first? So I don't have any specific um, recipe for you, but um, in working with colleagues and on projects where other people were helping to make those decisions or talking about their projects, the clear pattern has always been, the clear advice has always been control the weeds. Um, whatever method you choose, whether it's through tilling or successive mowing or through careful, you know, use of, of, of something like glyphosate, whatever 
whatever you're using or hand weeding, whatever methods you're using, you need to be able to control the weeds before you overseed. Um, the, especially for species which are um, aggressive enough to be able to overtop um, or crowd out the, the, the new seedlings that you're seeding in. Um, in that sense, I think I kind of quail when I think about, say, trying to start a green roof or um, entirely from seed. We're always, I mean, the beauty of what we're doing in the green roof is that there are, we're starting with a fairly controlled growing media. Um, we're putting down a companion crop, in this case, sedum, which can kind of hold the ground and look good um, and uh, provide cover quickly. And then we're overseeding into that as a, as, as a supplement. Um, and then the weeding, we have to be on top of it those first couple years. If we're not, and it gets, and either the clover or the foxtail get out of um, control, or the crabgrass for that matter, get out of control and, and reseed, trying to come, they have the ability to suppress the plants we want in the short term, and so trying to come back from that is very difficult. The answer may be a little different um, when you're working with a meadow on ground where the ultimate height is taller and then you need to be able to control the weeds ahead of seeding and for long enough that your seeds get out of that really short seedling stage to a point where they're higher than the common weeds you're seeing. And once they kind of overtop and lock up the ground, um, it'll get easier. All that right. helps. And we have time for just one final question. When designing your plant groupings, are you considering long-term performance to minimize soil disturbance and keep sequestered carbon in place? We're always thinking about long-term performance, actually. And, and honestly, you know, we don't talk more, we don't talk specifically about carbon tar targets. What we're talking about is having good, as high coverage targets because um, for those kinds of high elevated landscapes, our big issue is erosion uh, from wind or water erosion if it's got some contour to it. And so we're trying to get the cover type high. But, you know, really to have a long, so we want long-term, long-lived plantings that are going to be um, dense and be, you know, over 80% cover, 90% and above if we can get it. Um, and so for that, in some, I, we're usually talking about a combination of um, plants that are durable and long-lived individually and plants that are able to kind of reseed and persist through generations. And we've concluded that we need both. You need plants that are going to kind of hold the ground long-term, but you also need these reseeding species because they're your mobile patch kit. There, that will, if there's a disturbance or, a, you know, a plant dies off and there's a bare spot, they're going to come in and naturally, re, you know, fill that gap. And what I'd like to be doing is doing more conscious overseeding so that we're spiking the seed bank, if you like, for the species we would like to see or that we think might be good fit. Um, and therefore, perhaps diminishing the likelihood that what comes up in the bare gaps are the crabgrass and the green um, foxtail and, and, and clover and other weed species. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this really valuable information. It's given us a lot to think about, and I appreciate your time and sharing. Thank you for sharing your contact information in case someone did not get their questions answered. I appreciate you being willing to follow up with our listeners. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. I, I love these conversations. So um, any feedback would be awesome. Thanks so much.